What's up everybody, Pastor Luke McDonald. I'm here at Good News in the Neighborhood in Palatine, Illinois. Thanks for clicking on this video. Hope this message encourages you. Do all the stuff, like, tap, whatever. We're so glad that you're here and we hope that this blesses you right now. This is good news. And so I'd love the chance to preach to you now if that's okay. If you're ready, say ready. Why don't you turn in your Bible to the book of Acts in chapter 8. We've been just moving through uh, this story of the church after Jesus goes to heaven. And we've been working through it week by week by week by week. And uh, we've made it now. We're going to look at the back half of Acts chapter 8 today. And I'm excited about what we have to talk about. I just want to read you the whole story at the beginning. So you can hopefully kind of get your head around what the story is about. And then uh, we're going to talk about what God has for us today. I'm in the book of Acts. I'm in chapter 8. And I'm going to start in verse 26. If you're there and you're ready, please say ready. ready. I'm Luke, by the way. If I haven't met you, we're thrilled that you're here. Uh, um, this is Acts chapter 8 and starting in verse 26. It says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Arise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, a queen of the Ethiopians, returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now, the passage of scripture that he was reading was this, Like a sheep was led to slaughter, like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. Let the humili in his humiliation justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation for his life is taken away from the earth? And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with the scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Here's water. What, what prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water... The Spirit of God, uh, the Lord, carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. The, title, uh, the message today is called Good News Neighbor Evangelism, and I believe that this story gives us some tremendous insights into how we should go about carrying the good news of Jesus to the world all around us. Uh, I was struck by it so potently this morning. For everybody who's here in the room, uh, there's this softball tournament that kind of took a bunch of our parking. Uh, and, and I'm going to just leave out the how many people can get here on time for 7 a.m. softball versus church. We'll just put that part over to the side. We won't even do that lecture today. We'll just leave it to the side. But there is hundreds of people across the street right now enraptured in this sport. And yet here we stand. I, I'm looking out the door. I could hit a golf ball easily to where they're all standing right now. And so many of us know the good news of Jesus. And I venture to say many around the community today don't. But it's so challenging and so sometimes vexing to know how do I bring the good news of Jesus in a useful, effective way to the community that I'm part of. I think this text gives us a lot of insight into it. Remember, in the book of Acts, uh, back to chapter 1 and verse 8, this is kind of like the theme verse, or this is the goal. This is the, to use modern parlance, this is the apostles' why as they go about through their day-to-day -day life. It is this. It was given to them. This is what Jesus said right before he went to heaven. Just remember. He said, so you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So the apostles' assignment, the people who had seen Jesus, this same assignment carries to you and to me today. And the assignment is to take the good news of Jesus to the places around us further and further and further until it's made its way to every place on this planet. And this in Acts chapter 8 is starting to happen. They had been kind of stuck in Jerusalem, and the church had been getting larger in one place, and God saw fit, we talked about this the last few weeks, God saw fit to allow a persecution that had the church grow larger, not vertically in one place, but horizontally all over the place. And there's two ways to go. Some people are called to go to the ends of the earth. I, there's people that are called to learn new languages and be missionaries in other countries. There's people that are called to go far from where they're born to take the good news. There's also people that are called to go far to people right near them that are very different than them. 
we have to kind of shift just one notch our sense because in the world that this text was written to, right, it was people in pockets where everyone was the same all around the world. But now we live in a world where there are people vastly different from us all around us at every turn. It's vastly different with the advances in technology and, ge and geography. And frankly, the good news of Jesus has made it pretty much to every corner of this planet. There's some isolated little people groups in certain places, but you can find in every country and on every continent around this world. So the goal of take the good news to the ends of the earth has started to be reached, yet it hasn't made its way to every pocket of every community yet. What I guess I'm trying to say is there's two ways to go. You can go far physically. You can also go far locally. Uh, this text was one that was in my mind when we started this uh, church, this idea that we wanted to become and bring the good news to the community right around us. That you see here, Philip is able to share the good news in a really powerful way. He is able to, both by his conduct and also by his words, tell the good news about Jesus. So I just want to take this story one by one. I see five things um, in the text. I think, and I'm hoping they're all going to be helpful to you. So just back to the start in verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go towards the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. Now, if you want to study the Bible effectively, you need to just develop the discipline of seeing every word that's there. You know how, uh, you know how sometimes, if you're, if you're married, you'll understand this. You know how sometimes uh, you can get a text from a loved one and there's just a lot in just a few words? Even like the choice of punctuation can say a lot. And who's ever had that experience of like reading something that someone sent you over and over and over and over trying to make sure that you pulled out the meaning? Anyone ever gone through that? Am I the only? Okay. How are things going? Fine, period. <laughs> and the same is true for the Bible. Every word, every phrase that's in the Bible is there for a reason. So there's a lot being said just in this one little verse. So an angel of the Lord says to Philip, so he gets a special assignment. And the special assignment is, I want you to leave where you are. We talked last week that Philip was seeing incredible things happen in Samaria. He was seeing people come to faith. He was seeing the church expand. He was seeing incredible things happen through his gifts. And now, right when things were going great, God said, go. Not only did he say go, where he's supposed to go, do you see it? This is a desert place. There's a lot in that implication. He means literally where he's going is a desert place, but also there's not a lot of people there, and the good news of Jesus hasn't made it there. And I want to show you something I think that's helpful. So this is one of our five points in the message today. Good news neighbors live in the real world, uh, not in the Christian bubble. What God's assignment was for Philip was not to stay in Jerusalem, his first location, or Samaria, his second location, where there were lots of people who knew him, thought like him, had the same faith as him. God's assignment for Philip was to go to a place where he was going to be all by himself, other than having the power of the Holy Spirit, to try to bring the good news. And for 2,000 years, since this was originally written, there's been this tension in the people of God to decide how much of the world am I willing to participate in and how much of the world do I need to avoid to stay strong or, in some cases, to stay safe? And this comes around all the time. You see it's happening now in our culture. The, do you hear about what they're teaching in schools? And is it safe to put our kids in Christian schools? And should we, but is it safe to put our kids in public schools? And should we get over here? And is it safe to participate in culture? Or should we just kind of get away? And there's this thing. And you can find it all through 2,000 years of biblical Christianity is this idea of how much of the world should I let in and how much of the world should I hold out. And there's a wisdom required, not like a, it's the same answer for everybody. There's a lot that comes in when you're a parent that you think about these things a lot. But I think that we see something helpful and useful to us in this idea, and it struck out to me here, and it's all over the place in the book of Acts. God sent Philip to a place where he wasn't comfortable because he had an assignment. He sent Philip to a place where he wasn't comfortable because Philip had an assignment. And I would suggest to you that because, like we saw at the beginning of the book of Acts, our goal, 
the thing that God has us breathing in and out on this planet right this very second is not for maximum pleasure or maximum power or maximum possession or maximum safety. Our goal is to glorify God, and the way that God has told us he is most glorified is like we saw in the book of Acts 1-8, to take the good news to people around us. I would suggest that our willingness to participate in the world around us, even when it bothers us, and to bring Jesus with us there is what we should be looking to do at every turn and in every way that we can. It's super easy to look at the world and be like, that's a desert over there. I'm not going anywhere near there. I'm just going to stay over here. I'm not going over there. I'm going to stay over here. But the problem is that when we do that, we inevitably atrophy and are not effective anymore anyway. I've seen it over and over and over in my life. All this from this phrase, this is a desert place. I'm suggesting to you that if we want to do our job, we must be willing to go to the places where God has sent us, where we often don't feel comfortable because the people in those places don't have the same values, don't have the same desires, don't care about the same things that we do. That feeling, do you ever get that feeling? It happens to me like all the time. You know, you meet a group of people that I'm at a sporting thing and the parents are talking or this and that. And what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? And it's, what do you do? Oh, I'm a, I'm a, a pastor of a church actually. And then they kind of get the like, all the time uh, uh, and maybe you've had that experience of finding that the faith that you have can be a turnoff to people or it pushes people away but this is what God has us here for dear friends God doesn't have us here to maximize our enjoyment now that's coming when we make it to glory when we see God face to face when this life is finally over then it will all change and shift but for now we're not trying to live in the bubble where everything is perfectly Christian. We are willing to participate in the world around us because sometimes God calls us to a desert place. Next set of verses, read with me. And so, Philip, it says, and he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship, and he was returning seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. There's a lot of stuff being said right there in that verse, uh, and it's all going to fall into this heading. Good news neighbors know that Jesus unites what people divide. Jesus puts people together that have no reason to be together. So you see it. Here's all the descriptions of who this guy is. It's trying to show us, every word remember matters, how different this guy is. We never even hear his name. Then Philip, who he was about to talk to, and the people around him. He was an Ethiopian, so that means he was from Africa. That means that almost certainly he had black skin, which was different than the people where he was in Israel at the time, one. Second, he was a eunuch. Uh, if you don't know what that is, you're about to be amazed. Uh, this is a verse that describes the eunuch. This is from the book of Deuteronomy in 23. And I won't even read it probably, but we'll put it up on the screen uh, lest I get in trouble. This is a description of a eunuch. Uh, this is someone whose testicles are crushed or whose male organ is cut off. And that person in Jewish culture was banned from entering the congregation or the assembly of the Lord. This is a person who uh, often in the ancient world, a person who was high up in the courts of the king, their genitalia was mutilated. The king would have their genitalia mutilated so that they would be in no danger of procreating inappropriately inside the kingdom. Y'all just got a lot more interested. I'll just tell you, like your eyes are on me, like pretty, yeah. I know, it's okay, I get it, yeah. So not only does he look different because of his skin color, he also has this thing that makes him different because, do you see, and the text just keeps on going, he was a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. He worked for the queen, and he was in charge of all her treasure. So we found out that he was black, he was rich, he is high up in politics, he's different than the people around him. Also, crazy enough, he had come, it says, to Jerusalem to worship. So somehow, he was a participant in the Jewish religion that existed before Jesus. So everything about this guy suggests very different than Philip or the people around him. And it says that as he was going along in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. So in this day and time, if you were poor, you walked. 
If you were a little above poor, like Joseph and Mary in the Christmas story, maybe you had a donkey to ride. Maybe you had a, a horse to ride if you were a little more wealthy. Only the wealthy could afford a chariot. So you can imagine what this looks like. It's a few horses pulling some kind of buggy. And he's kind of like chilling while he travels. And he's reading the Old Testament scripture on a parchment, which if you had the Old Testament scripture on a parchment in that day and time, it means it had been copied by hand, which was expensive. So everything about this is rich, different person. What do we see? That God calls Philip to minister to someone who was nothing like him. And unfortunately, often, the church is known for being a place where if you're nothing like the other church people, you're not very liked by the church people. And that's true in almost any dimension. One of the things that we've been working hard at since we started this church together is we want to be a place for everybody. Everybody who finds their way here, we want them to have the experience of being welcome in Jesus' name. But the assignment that Philip is called to here is an unusual one because he is forced to unite with someone who he has nothing in common with. Keep on going. Verse 29. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So just like imagine how weird this is. The chariot's going along fast and Philip just kind of is standing there and he just starts like, it's the equivalent of walking towards a moving car. So Philip ran to him. And he could hear him reading Isaiah the prophet. Interesting little thing I learned that in the ancient world, reading was only done out loud. No one read silently. And so he had the boldness then to ask him, hey, like, do you understand what you're reading? And the guy says to him, well, how could I understand unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him in the chariot. This is pivotal. Good news neighbors look for open doors and walk through them. God brings Philip to right here, and he hears the guy reading the Bible out loud, and he walks towards him, and he has the boldness to be like, hey, I know you're like, I know you're rich, and uh, this is all implied, this part. I know you're, you're rich, and like I'm walking, and you're in a chariot, but I hear you reading the Bible, and like, do you have any idea like what's happening? kind of requires like a, a boldness and then the guy says to him well actually honestly I got no idea like I need someone to teach me implied come on up here why don't you teach me I think this is so significant as we think about bringing the good news to community to the people around us to our families to our in our lives it becomes so difficult has anyone ever felt this tension I want to say the right thing in the right way at the right time, but sometimes I don't know what the right thing is to say in the right way at the right time. Who's ever felt that? Like, I'm not sure, I just don't. Yeah, I know, Alyssa, yep, yeah, I know. <laughs> so I think we see three things here. What we're looking for, Paul prays a couple times in the New Testament that God would give him an open door. What we're looking for is the times when God gives us the opportunity to speak. And I think three things are required. I see them here in the text for an open door. One, presence is required for an open door. I have yet to hear the story of a person who found Jesus through an angry conversation that was started in a comment section somewhere online or through a person who started with like some kind of aggression towards them. I was at the farmer's market in Palatine yesterday down the street uh, and uh, these, there was all these Jehovah's Witnesses around kind of creeping on everybody. And uh, they're always dressed real nice, which is their first tip, because like people show up at the farmer's market, like they kind of roll out of bed and wander over there, but they're dressed real nice head to toe, and they try to engage you in conversation. If you've never talked to a Jehovah's Witness, they're trying to trap you. Uh, that is not a false religion. You can't believe what they believe and go to heaven because they believe that Jesus was not the son of God, but a son of God. They believe that Jesus is one of the gods, not the God. Uh, and so I didn't really have it in me to kind of blow them apart yesterday um, but they were in places I've seen them at the train station lately they're kind of hanging around I just pray that they knock on the door because that would be an open door for me to talk to them at my house but what are they doing they're putting themselves in places where people are to try to engage in conversation and this is so basic but we miss it Jesus can't move through us to people in places that we are not. And so our willingness to try and build 
relationships with the people on our street, with the people in our work, with the, the people in the pickup line, with the people in the gym, wherever the places are that you go in your day-to-day -day life, it requires presence for an open door. Second, it requires conversation. You can't miss this part. Philip's question is a brilliant question to gauge and engage someone's mind and heart. When he asks, do you understand what you're reading, what is he saying? He's really saying, like, do you want to talk about this? Do you want to? And there is nothing ever wrong and often really wise about trying to engage in conversation with the people around you for the purpose of drawing their heart towards faith. It requires a willingness to ask questions more than make statements. That's what he does here. And it requires a willingness to accept that awkwardness if they kind of like put it off. This happens to me again. It's like a little easier when you're a pastor because people kind of feel like you're opted into it. But often I'll say to someone, you know, we're a Christian church and trying to bring the good news to our neighborhood. And I'll almost always say like, can I, can I tell you a little bit about that? And then when a person, if they say anything other than no, they're saying, sure, you can tell me a little more about it. And engaging in conversation, is that's an open door. And then three, I think this is also significant, waiting for an opportune moment in a person's life or when the opportunity strikes. We have to be ready because we don't know when people are going to be ready to have these kinds of conversations. It often happens when life is going a bad or difficult way. And when the guy says, I mean, just imagine, he says from the chariot, I'm reading the Bible and I don't understand it. I need someone to explain it to me. That is a door to run through. Good news neighbors wait for the open door. They look for the open door. They run through the open door. I wonder how many people there are represented by the lives of all the people in this congregation now, whoever will be here in an hour of the next service, where there are people that God has placed in your life who are waiting for this conversation, even if they don't realize it, yet you haven't gone to the effort of trying to have it yet or trying to have it lately. God is using all the time the circumstances of life to bring people to a place, imagine it like fruit, to ripen them to the gospel. And so often it requires one of his people to step up into that. So let me tell you what they were talking about. This is the passage of scripture they were reading. This is from Isaiah chapter 53, and it's a description of Jesus on the cross. Apparently, this is exactly what the guy was reading. What he was reading was, this is describing Jesus like a sheep he was led to slaughter. Like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. And in his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. Look, so the eunuch said to Philip, Now, about whom I ask you, does the prophet say this? Is the prophet saying this about himself or about someone else? A little study you could find that this was a common debate in the first and second century. Was Isaiah talking about himself when he wrote Isaiah 53, or was Isaiah pointing to someone future, which is the correct answer, he was pointing to Jesus Christ. The eunuch asked a common philosophical question of the day and asked Philip to be able to explain it. Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. So what Philip was able to do was take what a person was thinking about and answer it, and then pivot the conversation towards pointing at the need that all people have for a Savior, and that Savior being Jesus Christ. I think it, I would say it like this, good news neighbors, learn the Bible and explain it. This is going to get a little hard here for a moment. So the eunuch asked Philip a common philosophical question of the day. I wonder what we would say, what are some of the common questions that people ask about the Bible or about faith today? Some of them are things like, isn't the Bible just a, you know, repressive, anti-woman, anti-justice, kind of like old white man thing? You might hear people say that out there. You might people hear people say out there, isn't like the whole point of the Bible just like it tells you a bunch of things that you shouldn't do and it's kind of a bit of a bummer? You might hear that. You, you might hear people say something like, I don't know, I, like what's all that weird stuff? In, isn't there a bunch of stuff in there about like dragons and and dinosaurs, and you might have people like might pick out a few. There's those weird, few weird verses you can find in the ceremonial law and Leviticus and Numbers, and they might say, isn't this in there? Like, what does this mean? 
And if uh, you're not in this world, it's all over social media and different places today. People trying to use the words of the Bible to make the Bible seem antiquated and stupid and old-fashioned. And if we want to be good news neighbors, if we want to be able to bring the good news to the people around us, we don't have the luxury of kind of doing like, because I said so to people. I'm learning this a lot right now as a parent. Uh, Kristen and I, my wife, she's downstairs with the kids. We have four kids. A few of them are in the service. And uh, when kids are young, they don't really require reasons. You can usually just kind of say, like, it's time for bed. And then when they are, don't, you know, like it or whatever, you just kind of go with, again, with, like, you're right, but it's time for bed. And that's usually good enough when they're three or when they're five. But somewhere along the way, and anyone who understands this at all can start nodding, so I don't feel like I'm a lonely, only person in the room. But I, uh, the Lord has blessed me with a 13-year-old in this stage of my life, and 13-year-olds often want to know, but why is it bedtime? So just because you're tired, that means I have to go to bed? I don't have school tomorrow. I don't have sports tomorrow. I got straight A's on my report card. I'm a nice kid. You know, all these kinds of things. And then you, as a parent, you're all of a sudden, you're like, well, well, you know, why is it bed? Why is it bedtime? You kind of start to double second guess yourself. To love children well as you're parenting, as they get older, you have to learn to provide reasons to go along with your authority. And for this generation and for the people in the world today, the Bible's true because I say it is, is should be enough and is adequate for some. But for many people, they want to know that what they're, under, you're, they're hearing from you or what they're understanding is more rigorous. Now, here's the good news. Just like Philip had a good answer to the Ethiopian eunuch and his question about the questions of the day, I can tell you with 100% certainty that the Bible is the greatest thing that has ever existed in human history. It stands up to all scrutiny. There are great answers to all the questions. If you want to understand it with an open heart, you can. You don't need to be back on your heels like some person in 2020-something figured something out that no one has been able to see for 2,000 years. The Bible isn't the problem. It's people holding the Bible who don't actually understand it that are often the problem. And we got to do better, dear friends, at understanding it. We have to put it into our minds more and into our hearts more so that when that moment comes where someone's like, right, but isn't like, okay, but like, just explain to me, just explain to me. So, so that Bible means that like God hates me because I'm gay? You're, you're going to have to do better at that moment. You're going to have to do a little better than sh shut up. You know, like it doesn't, you can't. And if we really love people, we have to work hard to have better answers than that and to know better answers than that and to not get all on our back foot. And one of the reasons, if I'm, one of the reasons that we often hesitate to bring our faith in Jesus to the people around us is because of a fear that it might get pushed back on us and we won't know what to say and then I'll feel like an idiot so maybe I'll just be quiet and like maybe I'll invite him on Easter maybe. And dear friends, we can do more and dear friends, we can do better. We can learn this book and we can learn what it says and if we learn what it says, we can develop easy, simple, if you understand them, ways of explaining things in the Bible that can allow us to feel confident not nervous. But like anything worth doing, it requires time, it requires some energy, it requires a little bit of work. The way that we're going after that as a community is we put these little Bible reading things out. Kristen and I do them together. We do them with our kids some of the days of the week as best as we're able. We want to put the Bible, some of it, into our minds, into our hearts every single day. And can I just tell you, this part right here, what Philip is able to do right here is why so many people struggle to see God do good things through their life because they don't have the ability to actually, they haven't developed the discipline of knowing what it says and so they don't have good answers. The single most life-changing habit that you could ever develop is putting a little bit of the Bible in your mind and in your heart every single day. And it doesn't have to be hours and hours and hours, it certainly can be, but if you put some of the Bible in your mind and in your heart every day, your life starts to change. Good news neighbors learn the Bible and they can explain it. And so I wonder if just midsummer here, if that's a little something that we need to grab onto 
as a community as we go towards the fall that more of us need to get more on top of. The story's almost over. Verse 36, and as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, so here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? So you can see what's happened. Philip has told him the good news of Jesus is what he's done. And the good news of Jesus is that there is forgiveness for sin through the payment of Jesus Christ for your sin on the cross and believing in his resurrection from the dead. And so when Philip got done telling him the spiel, what do Christians do? Christians go under the waters of baptism. And so the guy saw, like, I guess they were going by a pond on the chariot. And he was like, well, why couldn't I be baptized right now? Implication being, I believe what's stopping me from here. And so it says, so it's a, it's a rhetorical question. There was nothing stopping him from being baptized. And so the chariot stopped, and they both went down into the water, and he baptized him. And then another miracle happens. That's a miracle. Then another miracle happens. I love this. So it says that when he, we came, up, when he came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. So like you've seen someone get baptized before, right? I'm sure most of you have. So it was like Philip was doing the baptizing, and it's like he pushed him down into the water. And then as he picked him up, it says that Philip just disappeared. And the eunuch came up out of the water, and he was like, to me, that would have made me like wonder what was going on with the whole thing. But because it was the power of God, it says that he just saw him no more, got back in the chariot, and went on his way filled with joy. And Philip found himself... Uh, at Azotus, we may have a map that we could put up on the screen. That's like many, many, many miles away. And then he just went on with his job preaching the good news. Good news uh, neighbors, this is the last part. Good news neighbors don't delay when God says to obey. Still, we're, not, we're almost done now. Good news neighbors don't delay when God says obey. I am so stirred. I've been so stirred as I was studying this this week that this man who was so different than Philip. He apparently had some kind of longing in his heart to know who Jesus was. And when he heard the story, he was like, I want to do all of it. I want to obey right now. I don't need one more second. I don't need one more thing. And he was like, hey, there's a pond. Why couldn't you baptize me right now? There is something so potent and so powerful in delighted obedience. And so often, if we're being, just so often, we're kind of like, guilty of the half step back obedience yeah like i i, I won't, yeah I, i'm gonna take the garbage out you know like when 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 halftime comes you know kind of that thing he's driving along and all of a sudden he realizes this is the way the text reads to me he realizes that he believes and once he realizes that he believes he wants to do whatever he can do to show that he once he believes, he's like, what's the next step and the next step and the next step? Because I don't want to get stuck right here. What's the way that I should go from here? When I, I don't want to do, it's the same thing that we see uh, in the story of Zacchaeus. You remember that one, the wee little man? Uh, the wee little man was he? I don't, you know, okay, anyway, the, the story of Zacchaeus is the same, that when he realizes who Jesus is, he's like, I want to give all the money back that I stole, and I want to give it five times back over. There's this thing in the heart of a person that when they see what Jesus has done for them, they're like, I, after everything that he's done for me, like, I, I just want to do everything that he's asked me to do. And it's not this kind of like back-footed calm, like I'll get to it when I get to it, when I get to it, when I get to it. It's this, what can I do right now to show Jesus that I'm thankful for what he's done for me? What can I do right now to be obedient? Because if I'm really, really believing, I want to do everything. And he's like, there's water right there. Like, why can't we... Like, you just start to think about, so he was rich, but like what? So did he have like a second robe that he put on when he got back on the chariot? Or did he just get on the chariot soaking wet? Did he know what was in the water? Was, did he get gross? I've, I've gone to bodies of water where I promise you, you wouldn't have wanted to get baptized. Have you ever been to one of those nasty ponds or something? <laughs> he didn't wait for his mom to get there. He didn't wait so that he could get cleaned up and get some of the habits and junk out of his life. He was like, I want to do the right thing right this second because of what Jesus has done for me. And I wonder how many of us here, again, we're almost done now. I wonder how many of us here want God to bless our lives, want God to use us to see things happen in others, but are delaying in obeying 
in some segment of life while at the same time praying that God would bless us over here. So because it's the first one, uh, baptism is for sure one. The Bible makes it clear, we'll talk, it's going to come up in Acts more, that every person who's an adult, whatever way you want to describe adult, teenager and up, who's a follower of Jesus, should go under the water in front of somebody. I mean, it doesn't have to be a big group, because as far as we can tell, this was just Philip and this guy. And if you believe in Jesus, but you haven't been baptized yet, there's some delay there. Maybe you should get baptized today. Maybe you should come talk to me and you should get baptized like next Sunday. If you believe in Jesus and as an adult, you've never gone under those waters. And I get it. Like from here, it's like, what does going under the water do? Well, it's what Jesus asked me to do. Trust me, I'm in a relationship with my wife where she asked me to do things that I don't understand why they're important all the time. But you know why I do them? Because they're important to her. Can I get an amen anywhere in the house? That sometimes being in a relationship requires that when God says that that's what he wants us to do, that's what we do. The public part helps with the heart part. I wonder how many people are not giving financially to the Lord's work in the way that they should and yet are also asking God to bless them at the same time. We need to get all bogged down in this today. I think that the Bible teaches 10% is the minimum, and after that is free. But there's like all kinds of people that are giving nothing and arguing about percentages and this and that. I'm not really into that. To, uh, that's not the message for today. The message for today is that if some of what belongs to God is in your bank account and you're asking God to bless you, you're delaying and obeying, and I don't really see how he completely can in the way that you want. It may be a relational thing. There's maybe somebody in your life that you really need to call or text and ask for forgiveness from, from or make peace with. Maybe somebody that you haven't talked to in a really long time. There may be a person in your life who desperately needs the good news, but you've been worried about how the relationship might get morphed if you bring your faith into it, and so you've been delaying. I could go on coming up with ways that I think might be helpful, but I guess I just wanted to say that good, because I see it in this text, the good news neighbors, they don't delay when God says obey. When he figured out that he had faith, he wanted to do whatever the next thing was that he had to do. And our reasonableness and our reasons, and I'm going to get to it once I get to these three things, that a true heart that has a desire to honor God wants to obey right now no matter what the parts are of obeying right now that don't make sense. So there's a bunch of stuff in this message. You can bow your head and we're going to sing when it's done. We see here an incredible story of God supernaturally saving someone from their sin. Because God called Philip to live in the real world, not his little bubble of faith. And we see here, again, it's coming up over and over in Acts, that the people who really know the good news know that Jesus unites the things that people divide. Because people who know the good news look for open doors, and when they see open doors, they walk right through them. Because they've learned the Bible and can explain it. Because good news neighbors don't delay when God says obey. I just want to pray now, Lord. Lord, would you give us uh, Lord, would you give us the willingness to not nod and agree and make plans to do something differently and then never follow through on them? Lord, I'm so sick of wanting to do better and promising to do better and, and telling myself tomorrow I'm going to do better. Lord, would you break through our hearts of stone this morning? Would you, in your power, break the idols in us that keep us from obeying you? Lord, we didn't deserve your love or kindness, yet you gave it to us anyway. You saved us. Not so that we can just like be better than the people around us, Lord, but so that we can help share the things that we have found. 
And Lord, would you just help us, Lord, increasingly to see the people around us that don't know you. God, you put us here right now for them. I'm even just looking out the windows right now, Lord, at all these people playing sports across the street and all the people in our community right now, Lord. Uh, so many of us remember when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, yet you found us. Not because there's something good in us, but because you are loving and kind and holy and set apart. And so, Lord, break through all that is in us that doesn't want to obey, Lord. Wherever we've touched on something this morning, you've called us to take a step. Give us strength to take that step. Today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's stand to your feet. We're going to sing. I love this song. Let's sing together. Come on. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for watching this video. Hope you were encouraged by it. Please tap the bell, subscribe, like, text it, print out a transcript, and send it to your grandma. We hope you were encouraged by it. We hope we'll see you again soon. This is good news.